Our second panel, and we're going to ask those panelists to please come up at this time, is entitled Preparing for College and Career. And uh, this is, will be a consortium of both education and working professionals. Are they coming up? <laughs> All right, they are. Okay, and our facilitator is Lee Yan, the principal of the High School of New Language and Asian Studies. And the High School for New Language and Asian Studies is the first new language public high school in the state of New York. At this school, Chinese proficient English language learners and English proficient students can learn both languages while preparing for college and careers. And so, Mr. Yan will now also introduce the panelists. Again, the title of this panel is Preparing for College and Career. Good morning, everyone. And my name is Li Yan, uh, principal for High School for Dual Language Asian Studies. Uh, school's located on the Lower East Side. Uh, it's a small school. We have about 354 kids at this point. And uh, initially, we started the school with 100% health. And uh, as time goes on, at this point, we only have a 38%. Uh, usually, we're getting about 60 or 70% health after year or two. Most of, a lot of those kids will be tested out of the program and uh, moving to the other side and become officially English proficient student. As of today, we have 38% and else. And uh, the incoming ninth grade, we actually have a 60% else at this point. A year later, you know, they can move out. Uh, I have four distinguished guests on the panel. So I might I can ask them to introduce themselves first, and then uh, we get into have a discussion. So, okay, let me start in front of Ms. James. Good morning. Good morning. So, uh, I am Betty Jones, and I am currently a uh, assistant vice president and human resource business partner for TD Bank, America's most convenient bank. I am responsible for over 40, what we refer to as stores, as opposed to branches. Uh, I do manage on a daily basis employee relation issues, investigations, uh, employee as well as management executive coaching. And uh, I also partner with a team of recruiters who staff for various positions throughout the regions. So, uh, needless to say, I am very pleased to be here this morning. I thank you very much for the honor. And I look forward, hopefully, to sharing uh, some knowledgeable and very important information with you. Thank you again. Hi, uh, my name is Jessica Sloat. I'm an ESL teacher. Um, I teach at a Tenzer Learning Center, which is a um, freestanding ESL program on the Lower East Side. It's a small school. We have about, I think, 150 uh, students, and the majority of them are Chinese, coming from Chinese-speaking um, backgrounds. Recent immigrants, for the most part. Um, I teach, we all teach English as a second language in the program. It's a GED program, so our students are entering with the hope of getting a GED in English. Many of them already have um, high school diplomas, but not all. And we, they enter at five uh, different levels of proficiency. They're tested when they come in, and then they're slotted into five different proficiency levels from lower to higher and only the higher level students are getting ready for the GED. Um, I, in particular, I am responsible for teaching writing. Hi, my name is Heather Eisenberg, and um, I am a guidance counselor um, who also works for the GED Plus program, and one of my schools is Tenzer. I work with Jessica Sloat. Um, Lindsay asked me to speak about my whole background because I also did work in traditional high school. I got my master's degree at Teachers College where I specialize in cross-cultural counseling. And um, I originally worked at Flushing High School, which has a high Asian population. Um, and I also work at Tenzer, which like um, Jessica said, has a high Asian population. Um, 
in terms of my responsibilities at traditional high school and in our alternative GED program, they're very different. When I worked in traditional high school, there were almost 3,000 students at Flushing High School, and I was the only college advisor. And um, it was difficult, um, to say the least. I worked till 8 o'clock and 9 o'clock every night and took home work on the weekends. My husband became my assistant sometimes at home. Um, but I always did my best um, because I wanted my students to go to college. When I got the opportunity to interview for GED Plus, and I found out that I would um, not only be able to help kids with college, in small, manageable caseload, I worked with about 150 students altogether. Um, but I found out I'd also be working on dropout prevention um, because part of what District 79 does, which is um, the district that GED Plus and Tenzer is in, is that we push back a little bit on the Department of Education. A little bit is an exaggeration, actually. Um, every student who can either go back to their high school or go to an alternative high school like Lower East Side Prep, um, the two of the students who spoke earlier were from, we absolutely encourage them to go there. We fight back against the system that sometimes tries to push them out because of their age. Um, and there are times when it is appropriate or when the student makes decisions to do GED. But I said it's a caseload where I actually get to know every student's name. And um, I get to help kids not drop out of high school. Where do I sign up? So um, I began working for GED Plus three and a half years ago. And I do know all my students' names. And I continue to help them with college and career readiness. Hi, uh, I'm Lizzo Young. I wear many hats. Um, I'm an adjunct professor at Columbia University and New York University. I'm also a lawyer. I've been a civil rights attorney for the past 25 years. Um, I'm a consultant uh, to the New York Community Trust where I raise money and give out money to immigrant groups uh, throughout the city. Um, and lastly, and quite honestly, most importantly for this uh, workshop, I'm president of OCA New York, a nonprofit civil rights organization. Um, and I'm going to discuss later how uh, opportunities doing nonprofit volunteer work can open your door to many, many opportunities. Thank you, Pamela. And uh, I think now it's about time to talk about the college and the career readiness center. For the past 10 years, since we had the uh, reform movement in New York City 2002, uh, the focus has been on, on raising the graduation rate. And uh, now I think it from 40 or 50 percent, now it's about 60 percent. But how many of those students actually are college ready and career ready? And uh, as this question has been neglected and until now we are talking about it. Uh, in terms of the Chinese students, Asian, uh, Asian Chinese, uh, the tradition, a lot of people still believe they, they are still a model student and they don't have any problems in coming to school. They will do well, they will get into college of their choice. Uh, I've been working with the kids for almost 25 years. And lots of my students are former students or Asian, so I can tell you that's not the case. We all believe Asians are good at I can tell you I'm not. <laughs> and uh, the interest in the past, every time people actually I meet me will shake my hand and say, uh, Mr. Yan, yeah, you must be a math teacher. And I will turn around and say, oh, you must be an English teacher. <laughs> and uh, so uh, <laughs> we really have to, to, to change that. We have to actually focus on what's ready, what's not ready. And that a lot of Asian kids and Chinese students, we know need a tremendous help. They just like many other kids. As an EDS and not other ones, so we need to have a structure in place to really help them to get college ready. Okay, my uh, question, you know, and, um, first question, we're going to go towards Ms. Eisenberg. And uh, as a guidance counselor, school guidance counselor, I know uh, you've been talking about when you're working for Washington High School, one counselor, college advisor for all of those many, not for 3,000, you would graduate class for 900, 900 kids, 1,000 kids. Uh, what do you see we should do at this point? Well, how can we improve the system? What do you think? Where can we get it help? How do we do it? Okay. Well, within traditional high school, um, 
That is a difficult question. When I worked with 3,000 students, um, the assumption was that I mostly um, should work with seniors, and unfortunately, that became the scenario most of the time because I had 3,000 students and unfortunately only about 400 seniors because a lot of students had dropped out by that point. Um, and I think one of the solutions, um, both to the dropout issue and to helping kids with college and career, is to have more counselors. We actually had 11 counselors in that school, but that still wasn't enough. People still had caseloads of 400 students, and I had 3,000. Um, and it, it just wasn't enough. You need to be able to know all of your students' names. Um, you need to be able to go into classrooms. Um, for example, when I was in Flushing High School, I would visit the senior classes four times a year. That's just not enough. Um, and um, we would talk about college and career and the process, um, but I had absolutely no time to transition them to what they would expect when they got to college, that you're going to get a syllabus. Um, the professor's not going to tell you again what to do, and they're, like the students were saying, they're going to um, ask you to do all of this on your own. Um, I had, despite the fact that I had so many students, I actually had very good relationship with my seniors, and a lot of them came back and visited or emailed me. <coughs> and the question I would always ask them, what's the most difficult part of college? And the answer was that no one tells you anything twice, no one gives you a second chance. Um, so I think that I mean, it's a system-wide problem. It just is not enough focus on, number one, social and emotional education. Um, a lot of the focus is academic, in my opinion, and I, now that I work in GED Plus, I go into my classes every week, every class. Um, it's wonderful. And I can sit there and work with my students, um, not just on here's how you fill out a college application, but you know, what kind of services um, are there out there to help you when you get to college? I can demonstrate to my students how to do things and then ask them to do it on their own. So um, I think there needs to be more staffing and um, I also think that in terms of just the academic preparation, um, a little less hand-holding, show a student how to do something and then allow them to do it on their own, whether they pass or fail, but allow them to do it. Um, I hope that adequately answered it. Yeah, working at a GED bus program is obviously very different from working uh, at Flushing High School. Yeah. And uh, tell us, to describe a typical day as a guidance counselor at Flushing High School, what do you what do you do? Do you get a chance to actually talk to kids, or is okay. it advising, grade advising? What's your work like? Okay, so when I worked at Flushing High School, um, I almost felt like a celebrity. Um, <laughs> That's the only way I could put it, and I'll, it, this is going to go into my typical day. And the reason why I almost felt like a celebrity was because I couldn't even go to the bathroom without having a student come up to me who had a hall pass to ask me a question because they were desperate for information. Um, and also, my signature was worth money on fee waivers, so um, my autograph was worth something. But, uh, so my typical day was students needing me so, so badly uh, that I couldn't even go to the bathroom. Um, and yes, I would do some one-on-one -on -one counseling, um, but unfortunately it was limited to, um, the way I would do it is I would do a survey in class and I would do one-on-one -on -one college counseling with students who were interested in private schools, uh, with students who were interested in SUNY, and students who had an 80 or over average. Um, it was the only way to do it. Um, because I was, I spent every waking moment when I was in the school with the students, um, working with students and not doing paperwork. That's why I was there till nine o'clock at night. So those were the students I met with individually. The other students I met with in groups. Um, and um, if they were applying to CUNY, I'm just being quite honest, we did the CUNY application in groups, if that's what they were interested in. Um, and it was the only way to do it with that many students in that little time. Um, a day in the life of GED Plus, um, I do personal counseling. I do um, 
college counseling with every single student, um, no matter where they want to go to college. And um, I go into their classrooms once a week. Um, and we talk about all different kinds of subjects, not just college and career, but life preparation as well. Um, how do you deal with difficult people? How do you deal with difficult situations? Um, you know, how do we become perseverant? How do we um, make decisions? Um, these are all the types of things I do um, at Tenzer and at my other site, which is the Manhattan Hub. And my life at Flushing High School was very different. I didn't get to do any of that. Um, it was always kids grasping at me, and I didn't blame them. I understood why they were stopping me. Um, but it was very difficult. And actually, Pat Lowe, um, I worked with her. I wrote curriculum um, for a summer program. It's actually the program that she was talking about. It evolved into a College Now program. Gave me one of the few opportunities that I had to work with a small group of students over the summer. She allowed me to write curriculum. It was two guidance counselors and two um, ESL teachers writing curriculum for college readiness. Um, and we got to do it over the summer when I had no other, uh, no other obligations. And um, we prepared those students so, so well. And it was one of the best opportunities that I had there. And actually also, I had one other thing, Flushing High School, I took over supervising an SAT program where students were getting free um, SAT preparation paid for by the Peter J. Sharp Foundation. Um, and it was another thing to put on my plate, um, but we were about to lose the program because the attendance was so bad. Um, so I put it onto my plate. Um, under um, my firm hand, we had between 95 and 98% attendance the whole four years that I supervised it. Um, and we saved the program until it ran out of money. But um, that was another opportunity, like Pat's opportunity, where I got to know some of my students because I would see them on the weekends. Um, but that was my typical day. Thank you, and from this over on Miss James, you, both of you, none of you are from the traditional uh, educational background. I want to hear from you, from your perspective, what do you think the world should do, the school or the college should do to prepare kids? So they can ready for college or ready for career, and uh, what can you do as a nonprofit organization, as an outside school organization? What can we do? I think it's very important for students to realize that, in terms of career development, they are entering a different culture, and you're entering a different stage of your life. It's a very independent stage, therefore you're going to deal with different personalities, it's a different environment, as I said before, a totally different culture. And to begin to introduce yourself and familiarize yourself with what you're about to get involved with, you should know yourself. I think it's very important to understand and know your personal brand, your bringing and what it is that you're bringing to the table. So know what your interests are, first of all. What is your area of expertise? What do I have to offer the business world? What do I have to bring to corporate America, if you will? So first of all, really understanding what you have an interest in. I think it's very important for our educators to begin to introduce the world of business and working to our students to let them know that the language is different, presentation is important and different, dress is different. So, you know, it, it, again, it's very important to know what is it that the employer is looking for and what do I have to do? Can I walk into an interview, sit in the chair the way I sit in the chair when I'm speaking to my counselor where I'm very relaxed and laid back and so my posture is different, my verbiage is different, my facial expressions are different, do I sit the same way in front of a recruiter or a prospective employer? So I think it's extremely important for our counselors and our educators to become familiar at, with the business world and the working world, if you will, in order for them to share that with the students. Um, there are so many components in terms of you know, having a, a well-prepared resume. Um, and what that resume represents. But I think experience is one of the, the most important components. So to begin to introduce students to volunteering, 
to having uh, exposure, I can't say that enough, informational interviews and conversations. You know, call up uh, an individual at a business that you may have an interest in and ask if you can shadow for the day. So you can become familiar with what the world of work, if you will, is all about. You know, you walk into McDonald's, you walk into retail stores, and you see that individual in their element as they're working. If you're looking to get into the business, however, perhaps if you walk into the bank, maybe, you'll see the banker sitting at the desk, but when are you really exposed to the business atmosphere? You also, perhaps, uh, I think it's extremely important for you to have a mentor. Mentors are very important individuals to have in your life, and you can have more than one mentor. And you should seek out a mentor in an industry that you are interested in. Thank you. Um, I'm going to break it down into two. One is, what can people do to help prepare high school students for college? And as a teacher at um, Columbia University and NYU, um, it's very uh, important um, when I see students going uh, uh, to college that they have um, developed speaking skills. Um, many Asian American students are used to you know, going to class, but not speaking up in class, um, you know, or um, when asked a question, giving an answer to a question, but not participating necessarily in open-ended questions where you're not talking about a right or wrong answer, but you're talking, you know, you're asking them to think analytically and come up with a response. Um, in my classes, I give 25% of the grade towards class participation. So um, I think it's very important that at the high school level, um, we build confidence in our young people to speak. Um, and it's very, very critical. Um, and with respect to uh, career um, preparation, it's a very competitive world right now. I don't have to tell this audience that. Um, you know, uh, many people uh, used to go to law school when they, you know, uh, were in between jobs, and now many lawyers or graduating law students can't get jobs. Um, so networking is absolutely, absolutely critical. Um, and uh, oftentimes, it's, nowadays, with so many people qualified for jobs, it's not that you're not qualified. It's who you know often that makes that difference. You know what I mean? Um, and so the networking skills are absolutely critical. And as president of OCA New York, I can tell you that it's an opportunity. Um, well, I can't uh, underscore enough what the previous speaker said is that civic engagement um, is an excellent way to meet people. Uh, we are a nonprofit civil rights organization. On our board, we have um, anywhere from uh, professionals, uh, um, you know, PhD, uh, uh, JDs, um, masters, uh, to high school students, to retired police officers, to um, you know, city administrators, um, you know, you name it. Uh, we are currently involved in the case of Private Danny Chen. Um, I'm not sure if people have heard of it. If you've heard of it, please raise your hand. Okay, good. Um, he uh, was a 19-year-old uh, who uh, was uh, killed, uh, or was found dead in Afghanistan, but not because of combat-related injuries. Um, an investigation is now ongoing into his death. But who are we working with on this mobilizing campaign? You know, we recruited high school students. Um, you know, his cousin is a, a Hunter College a student. He's been very active in the organizing. Um, the students at NYU helped to um, do a YouTube video. It's gotten over 2,000 hits in like five days uh, um, on Private Danny Chen. Um, uh, my college students at Columbia did a Facebook um, for uh, it. We're holding a vigil, um, you know, uh, in uh, Chinatown on December 15th. Um, 
And uh, we're having an annual general membership meeting, which people are invited to attend, um, which uh, gives high school students an opportunity to interact with elected officials. U.S. Congresswoman Nydia Velasquez is one of our guest speakers. City Councilwoman Margaret Chin um, is coming. Danny Chen, the cousin, Hunter College student, is going to read from Danny's diary. Um, so there's excellent opportunities to interface with a wide range of people through civic engagement. Also, high school um, educators should know by encouraging your students to become involved in nonprofit civic organizations, there are scholarship opportunities, um, both at the local and national level. We are one of 80 chapters nationwide. OCA National offers scholarships to college for students who are the first one in their family to go to college. Um, and then other various chapters also offer scholarships. So it's also an important opportunity um, you know, uh, uh, for um, being able to attend college. This is Slo, as ESL teacher. And, uh, teaching the TV program. Just give us a very brief description of what the TV program is and uh, how long do you have your students with you and what's your responsibility uh, for getting kids ready, uh, college and career ready? Okay, well, a brief answer is hard, but um, um, let me start by saying that um, we're part of uh, District 79, which if you, if you, it's called Alternative Pathways to a High School Diploma. And um, the GED, uh, in the GED world, um, at least in New York City, they decided, our, our principal decided last year to address college and career readiness. And the feeling was, and the facts showed, that merely getting a GED for those who actually managed to do that did not mean you were college and career ready. Answering a multiple choice exam and be having the reading um, comprehension ability to answer multiple choice questions in three hours did not mean you're ready for college. And so many students who actually those who, the, 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 those who did get the GED would then find, realize that they weren't ready pretty quickly. Um, so we have we're, this is our first year. We've instituted a new requirement, a, a graduation requirement, which is a portfolio. And every student, in order to be recommended to sit for the predictor, we have a whole protocol of how you get to take the GED. In order to, to be um, eligible to sit for the predictor, you must have completed a portfolio. And the portfolio consists of you have created a resume for yourself and a cover letter. You have written a um, personal statement essay along the lines of a college essay. And you have done an academic research report. And these were never required before in our program, and now they are requirements. So we think this is a really important and great step. And it's a, it, there's a learning curve for teachers and for students how to integrate this and how to teach it and how to get kids, you know, to make them understand the importance of this. Uh, part of the problem in the GED world is that many students come to us thinking that it's something they can do very quick, just get your GED quickly, and then you have a life or something like that. Um, they find out that it's not so easy, the GED, in the first place, and it takes a while to, to get to the point where you can pass it, and especially for L's. Of course, um, in our school, uh, we have students who are coming to us, they're 18, 19, and 20 years old, and they don't speak much English. They have a huge learning curve ahead of them to jump in at that point in their lives, to learn English, some of them from the ground up, from scratch. And um, so in many ways, our program is, it, they come to us to learn English first. They're, but the difficulty is they're, they're learning English through academic language, through academic content areas, through uh, the five areas of the GED are math, social, uh, social studies, uh, language arts, reading, and writing. 
There's five different tests they have to pass. So we teach those five different content areas. So they're trying to learn English as they learn all this content in, in English. We're very much aware as, as English lang uh, teachers of English language learners, we try to create as many opportunities for conversation in the classroom, for exchange, for interactive dialogue. Um, with a lot of resistance, our Chinese speakers often culturally, again, as somebody just said, you know, are not used to answering open-ended questions, thinking critically, um, having dialogue, debate. Uh, they're very shy in many cases. And part of the problem also is that we're a self-contained program, and, and for some reason Chinese students tend to come here to that program, so it's very hard for them to... Um, they're among other Chinese speakers, so they're, so they're not having social interactions in English outside of you know, the planned interactions in the classroom. In the lunchroom they speak Chinese, in the park they speak Chinese, after school they speak Chinese. Also, um, they, um, they are not your, what's the typical stereotype. Some of them are not motivated, some of them are, but not all equally. Um, they do suffer from um, um, a lot of um, isolation and, and loneliness and depression. They're, they don't know other kids, they don't know Americans, they go home where they speak Chinese. They're, many of them, their parents don't want them to go to school. They want them to go and work. They get sent out in the summer or sometimes they, leave, they disappear for a couple of months. Where were you? Uh, I was in Arkansas. In Arkansas? What were you doing there? I was, I was working in a Chinese restaurant in Arkansas or in Virginia or in South Carolina. They're just plucked out, they're sent somewhere, they work seven days a week. They just have to make money. Um, so they're not all equally motivated to, to learn English or to learn academic content. They're also coming from, they're mostly from Guangdong and uh, Fujian. They're coming from very poor situations. Many of them don't know their own families. Their family, their parents left them when they were one, two, three years old to either work in the city or come to America. So they come here to reunite with families they hardly know. So it's a big, a big, a lot of adjustment for them and they're kind of lost, many of them. And they have no connect, the school is really a social place for them. Mondays is a day where you can hardly get them to concentrate. They're so happy to be back with the other kids. They hate vacations. We ask them how a vacation was boring. What did you do? Nothing. I sat home and, you know, on, on the computer. They don't know the city. They're afraid to go out. And so yeah, I think it's particular to our school because it's a magnet for Chinese students. Um, and they're coming to us so late. Uh, but that's, that's the situation that we face. So teaching writing, I, I, I really love it because you get them to express themselves and you find out a lot about them. It is like pulling teeth, but you're learning. Um, we're doing a research project now. Many of them said, I never did a research project before. You know, they don't know anything about it. So I, it, their educational backgrounds are very um, uh, different. Some of them have more and some less, but there doesn't seem to be great academic or at least it's not comparable. I don't really know much about the Chinese education system, but what we're doing is very different, they tell me, from what they had done in the past. Since you have a large number of uh, uh, Chinese students in your school, uh, uh, your program, do you have a special program for those students? Do you do anything special to help them to overcome their particular problems? Or how do you, how do you help them? Well, the program itself is, we have a very enlightened uh, principal assistant principal. So she tries to partner with as many other organizations. We don't really have much in the way of after school. Many of them have to work after school. But we've partnered now with Public Color where they go and they paint, um, they paint public schools. They make a little money and um, it gets them out into the world a little bit more. We're looking for more partnerships. We do as much as we can, but we're so kind of focused on the academics and teaching them English. Um, we try to bring in artists so they can do some, some art uh, creativity, use their creativity to express themselves, uh, whatever we can find to bring in to enhance the program. And then we have these wonderful uh, uh, college uh, counselors who really help them step by step and do also life skills with them, um, how to talk to people, how to look people in the eye, how to shake hands, you know, it's just basic, basic things like that.
I, I know some are running out of time, but I'm now going to take questions. See if you have any for my panelists over here, please. Yes, and my name is Deborah White, and I'm uh, adjunct faculty here at uh, NCNY. It sounds like in your GED program, there would be an opportunity to um, create a buddy system for your students and individuals outside of your program who would be willing to volunteer their time to help um, these individuals learn about the city. How do you ride the subway? You know, what are some of the basic sites or, or resources in Manhattan? The, the, how you kind of walk up and down and, and navigate the city. I mean, or you know, not just Manhattan, although that would be obviously a, a starting point, but, but other boroughs as well. Um, we'd love to uh, talk with anybody who's interested in partnering with us to mentor students or uh, big brother, big sister type of operation or take them out on the weekends. Some of us do, um, we try to schedule as many trips and introduce them to the city and different places in the city. Some teachers have even gone, you know, taken them out on the weekends. Um, but um, we're open to partnerships. If, if someone were interested in doing that, would it be necessary that they are fluent in Chinese? I'm not. I'm oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, sure. I have a question regarding your program. You are helping kids to get their GED. Um, do you face or do you have to meet the same criteria like progress report, graduation rate, like the regular public school? No. No. So your students, they are focused on the five subjects you just mentioned, or just to pass the GED. They, because in public school, students, we face the same type of students you have who come in very late in age and have very little English, but they have to pass the English regions, pass the social studies regions. They have to face and meet the same criteria for high school graduation um, requirement. But in your program, your students do not need to meet the same. But they're not, they don't have to take the regions. They're out of that already. They're, they're, they're aiming for the GED. So, and then if that's the case, do you think that your students are prepared when they enter college and face the challenging no. No, courses in college? No, they're not prepared. And um, there are a couple of programs. There's uh, a college bridge program that CUNY has, I believe. We have. We have. We have. We also have a college bridge program. Heather can speak about that better. Um, Go ahead. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, I think that um, many students are not prepared for college, whether they're coming from high school or GED. We actually got some numbers on that, which is why we are reforming our program. Um, but only um, 60, I think it's 60. 8% of high school graduates pass the CUNY writing placement test, and only 33% of GED graduates. All right, and it's a long, the math is about similar. The reading actually is about equally as high, both in 70 something percent of GED is highly reading intensive. Now, this is not, um, the placement test is not the only thing that says whether they're prepared, but according to the placement test, no, they're not being prepared which is why we've added in the initiative of having um, personal statements, research project, resume and cover letter. Um, instead of an actual exam, we're giving projects. And because we have teachers like Jessica, um, they're getting done really, really, really well. Because if you give Ms. Slope um, a project to do, she runs with it. Um, and um, I work with um, the kids who are going, actually all the kids, but um, especially much with the kids who are getting prepared to go to college next year. And um, what I'm doing with them are post-secondary plan projects. And some of them, I do have to say this district requires it. Um, some of them are in your folders. However, they are experimental um, and will be edited. So um, feel free to use and share, but um, and what they're really concentrating on are self-exploration um, in terms of interests, abilities, values, um, career exploration, financial planning, um, and college planning, and a reflection on their experience. So I, I'll add to the bridge. Um, I'm sorry, it's okay. Um, but um, that is what I'm working with 
with kids on class. I'm really, I think it's a big step in the right direction in terms of college preparation. When I looked at the forms, I said, well, they are a prototype. They definitely were not written for ESL students. The majority of our district is not, but Tensor is, and my other school has ESL students as well. So the first thing I did with it was write unit plans. My unit plans are in there also. Um, and I broke it down for ESL students to start with um, instruction and to end up with them actually learning how to do it on their own. Um, so um, I think it's definitely a step in the right direction. What I would like to see happen with um, that type of preparation next year is for them to be broken down a little more. Instead of having six post-secondary plan forms, I'd like to see about 15, because you'll see in some of my unit plans, there are like 12 content goals. That's too many for a four-page piece of paper. Um, but um, otherwise, I think that they're great, um, and they're definitely workable. And we also have, like um, Slope was saying, a College Bridge program that the 279 actually runs. And it's open both to GED students and high school graduates, um, whether they graduate from New York City or from another country. Um, and basically, it's for students either who have a break or who um, don't feel ready for college. Um, and what they do is actually help students prepare to take the real ACT in lieu of a CUNY placement test or um, help prepare them for whatever placement test they're going to take for whatever college. But they also work on some of the skills that I work on with them as well, including interviewing skills, how do you dress, how do you do an interview. Um, they help them with all kind of um, life skills as well. Um, so um, if you're interested in that, I'll have to give you my contact information um, afterwards because I can get you in touch with somebody who can help with that. All right, thank you. I think I have uh, time for two questions. And there are two more questions, if we have any. Yes, What's the secret behind your success? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, our school, we have a large male students of uh, 7% Asian, and uh, students coming to us, basically they'll all be here three years or less. What we have to do is a focus, and uh, all the money goes to education, goes to instruction. And the small school we have in terms of the money we only supposed to staff only one principal, one system principal, one school secretary, two school mates. That's basically for all supporting staff in the school. Everything goes to the teachers. Uh, we do offer the kids, students, uh, uh, for example, the ESL students. I'm just trying to speak very quickly. Uh, if the state mandate, if the beginner level ESL students, you have to, you have to provide them three periods of ESL every single day. Uh, for us, it's uh, throughout the four years, doesn't matter which level of ESL can be, beginner level, intermediate level, advanced level, everyone receiving three periods of ESL every single day. That costs a lot of money, and that's one of the reasons why we actually prepare the kids. The other thing is they have to have high expectations. Just basically graduate from a high school in New York State does not mean the kids are ready for college. Graduating means 65 on five subjects. Test the regency exam, basic, the five basic regency exams, that's going to be ready. You have to set a high standard so they you know you have to prepare in such a way to get them ready and hire over high level courses and give them a true help. School, our school open from 7.15 to 6 o'clock every single day, uh, 9.30 to 2.30 every single Saturday. They will have time staying there to do the work and we have people there helping them. They provide them with the opportunities, that's how we do it. Thank you very much.